Days ago, the Pentagon released scary videotape with the audio tacked onto it showing Iran speedboats apparently harassing three U.S. Navy warships, including a guided missile destroyer in the Strait of Hormuz. That's the same place 20 years ago that a U.S. guided missile near the end of the Iran-Iraq war brought down an Iran civilian airliner killing nearly 300 people, including 66 children. On the tape that was just released by the Pentagon last week, a menacing voice is heard to say in broken English, I am coming to you. You will explode after a few minutes. The only problem now the Navy is saying they don't know if that voice had anything to do with the speedboats. They don't know if that voice was Iranian. It sounded to me like Borat had broken in. <laughs> it sounded, in fact, completely staged. The tape with the inflammatory audio threats was prominently aired on every single national TV, radio, uh, TV and radio network in the country, including PBS and NPR. Few of these networks have given prominence to the doubts about the audio. We should be contacting Congress this week, senators, Congress members, and demanding that they have a congressional hearing on whether this was some sort of hoax to provoke us into a war, just like the Gulf of Tonkin hoax provoked us into the last war. The tape was used by President Bush to threaten Iran yet again with the words, no option is off the table. He called it a provocation. It was nicely timed, this tape, very nicely timed for his trip to the Middle East where he wants to unite the Sunni and Arab regimes against the uh, Shia and the, per uh, the Persians of Iran. Cheney, as you know, was in the Gulf a while back threatening Iran. American citizens have to ask themselves, who's threatening whom? Who's provoking whom? I try my best to imagine, as you know, I'm a student of talk radio and American media, try to uh, imagine how talk radio in this country would react if somehow the situation were reversed, if somehow there were huge Iranian naval warships off the Atlantic Ocean. And I, I can almost hear that talk radio screamer, Glenn Beck, on CNN and on his many uh, Clear Channel radio stations exhorting the Yacht Club members from the elite U.S. Republican Guard to go out and harass the Iranian warships with their yachts. <laughs> um, the scenario, I guess, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because while well-off Republicans are very good at starting wars lately, they certainly don't like to fight in them. I think of Mitt Romney endorsing as loudly as he can the occupation of Iraq, 120 percent, endorsing the threats to Iran, and I think about his five military-aged sons bravely fighting off the terrorists from Iowa to New Hampshire to Michigan to South Carolina. My focus, of course, is media. When it comes to mainstream media, there is one imperative, one rule that best explains U.S. coverage of war and military of intervention. With apologies to the WHO, that rule is, we will get fooled again. Sometimes corporate media will debate military tactics or the pace of military success. But rarely do they question the legality, the morality, the divine right of U.S. military or CIA to invade in country after country across the globe. From the perspective of independent, accurate journalism, mainstream media coverage of the run-up to the invasion of Iraq was a massive failure. Unfortunately, we know from a historical perspective uh, if we've seen the new War Made Easy movie featuring Norman Solomon, you know that mainstream media have repeatedly throughout history led our country into war or invasion, repeatedly based on concocted evidence, false pretense, repeatedly relying on official sources who were unreliable and usually unnamed. One of the prime culprits globally in the journalistic failure called Iraq 
was a former employer of mine, the media mogul Rupert Murdoch. His media outlets were the loudest in continent after continent after continent, from Australia to England to here with Fox News Channel and the New York Post and the Weekly Standard in pushing the loudest for war with Iraq. And now he owns the Wall Street Journal. And if the FCC gets his way, he'll be buying up more and more media properties when they abolish the cross ownership or weaken the cross ownership rule. But the journalistic failure of Iraq goes way beyond Rupert Murdoch. It goes beyond the TV networks. It goes beyond talk radio. And it goes right to the, the two leading so-called liberal dailies in our country. In the months leading up to the Iraq invasion, the Washington Post published nearly 30 editorials in favor of the war. On its op-ed page, also dominated by hawks denouncing war skeptics as liars and fools and worse. After semi-apologizing for its coverage leading up to the invasion of Iraq, how did the Washington Post rectify the situation? They hired George Bush's chief speechwriter, Michael Gerzen, as a regular columnist. He's the man who spun the false rhetoric that was swallowed by the Washington Post editorialist. He's the man who inserted the references to the yellow cake from Niger fable in President Bush's speeches. He's the man who concocted that uh, soundbite warning about Iraqi nukes that we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. He's the guy who helped prepare Colin Powell's dishonest speech to the United Nations. What's the motto at the Washington Post? We will get fooled again. The New York Times front page was instrumental for, in invading Iraq with scare stories relying on unnamed White House or intelligence sources that turned out to be totally false about Iraq's alleged nuclear weapons threat. That was not just a failure of the reporters Judith Miller and Michael Gordon. That was a failure of the paper's top news editors, most of whom are still in power. After semi-apologizing for its bad coverage, how did the New York Times rectify its situation? By giving even more power to the reporter Michael Gordon. He writes the page one articles in allegedly objective voice on the need to keep troop strength up in Iraq. And then he appears on TV where he becomes an unabashed advocate for the Iraq occupation. Last February, it was Michael Gordon who wrote an important page one story with the amazing claim that Iran's supreme leader had approved sending lethal explosives into Iraq to attack US soldiers. It was a claim that even Bush was retreating from within a matter of days. But one couldn't assess Gordon's charges because as usual, they were virtually entirely based on anonymous sources. About 25 times in the article, Gordon wrote, United States intelligence asserts Administration officials said, some American intelligence experts believe, American officials say, on and on and on. After analyzing this article, the blogger Jonathan Schwartz came up with a theory. He said, quote, Gordon is not an actual person, but rather a voice-activated tape recorder, end quote. <laughs> Whether Iraq in 03 or Iran in 07 and 08, the New York Times motto seems to be, we will get fooled again. Last week, the New York Times had a fascinating article headlined for Pentagon and news media, relations improve with a shift in war coverage. When you read the lead sentence, it's a bit like that children's game, count the errors in this picture. The lead sentence reads, the anguished relationship between the military and the news media appears to be on the mend as battlefield successes from the troop increase in Iraq are reflected in more upbeat news coverage. I mean, after reading this article, I began to think that we could come up with a solution at the New York Times if we just instituted random drug testing for hallucinatory drugs. <laughs> Paragraph five, at the start of the Iraq war, Decades of open hostilities between the military and the news media dating from Vietnam were forgotten, if only for a brief and shining moment. <laughs> like everyone in this room, I remember those open hostilities during the first Gulf War when our TV networks were positively orgasmic about the smart bombs and the Patriot missiles. I remember the hostilities when they were swallowing during the invasion of Grenada every single lie that the Reagan administration could put out. 
We all, of course, remember their open hostilities between corporate media and military during the invasion of Panama, probably the weirdest drug bust in history and certainly one of the most lethal to innocent civilians. I was monitoring TV news coverage during those first hours of the Panama invasion and the correspondents and anchors didn't know if they could call the invasion an invasion. It was, of course, illegal under international law. Uh, killed all these innocent civilians, but they were worried. That they hadn't gotten the green light from the Pentagon that, or the White House that this was an invasion. So they were calling it things like an affair, an expedition, an operation, a military action. One anchor referred to Panama invasion as an insertion. Some of you may have noticed that I can work myself into a fit when discussing the New York Times. Trust me that even if you don't read the New York Times, that paper is so influential that you are getting the Times biases on economic policy, foreign policy, elections here and abroad, whether you, no matter what mainstream media you consume, especially if you consume the Oregonian, especially if you consume NPR. My friends worry that one day I'm going to let the New York Times provoke me into a heart attack or a stroke. Rest assured that I use the Times as a source of mirth and laughter. It's usually unintended laughter. When the New York Times puts clothes on the emperor, it just makes me laugh. Last year, during the perjury trial of Vice President Cheney's chief of staff, a Times News report stated, the trial has chipped away at the public image of Mr. Cheney as a sober-minded policy architect. <laughs> That got through a couple editors. You have to understand when you're reading the Times, it's the most edited newspaper in the country. I also turned to the funniest part of the New York Times, which is the corrections box, the main function of that box, of course, with, with its picayune corrections of utterly insignificant facts, is to say everything else we reported yesterday is totally true. <laughs> a few days ago, the Times offered this correction. A front page article about the elevation of Benazir Bhutto's 19-year-old son to succeed her as, as chairman of the Pakistan People's Party misstated the name of the college he attends at Oxford University. It is Christ Church, not Christ Church College. <laughs> like a lot of you, I wasn't sleeping well until that correction was... Uh, but here's, here's the more substantive correction that I've been waiting to see for years and I am not holding my breath. But this is the correction we all have to be thinking about when we read the New York Times, Washington Post, Oregonian, the so-called liberal papers. Yesterday's reporting was based on the assumption that U.S. foreign policy is motivated by noble intentions and democratic aims, unaffected by economic or corporate interests. <laughs> that assumption is wrong. We regret the error and retract all of yesterday's coverage. <laughs> I'm just going to talk a few more minutes before I turn over the floor to Scott. But I want to ask the trivia nuts out there, who here can tell me what the subtitle is of the movie Dr. Strangelove? Yes, you've got it. How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. You could put a similar subheadline lately on mainstream coverage of Iraq. How I learned to stop worrying and love the occupation. For the realities of Iraq today, you have to go to the independent media. You have to go to the British Guardian. You have to go to the British Independent. You have to go to writers like Scott Ritter, uh, Dar Jamal. According to a recent BBC ABC poll that surprisingly hasn't been heard much in the mainstream media here at home, huge majorities today of both Sunni and Shia Iraqis want the U.S. troops gone, and 57% of Iraqis today support attacks on U.S. troops. Patrick Coburn wrote recently in The Independent that, quote, Iraq has become a land of warlords. Of course, there's less violence in Baghdad because, as Dar Jamal writes, it has essentially been ethnically cleansed, ethnically divided, entire neighborhoods surrounded by concrete walls and security checkpoints. Normal life has all but vanished. During the so-called troop surge, the number of Iraqis, according to the Iraqi Red Crescent, that have been displaced, that, that number has multiplied, displaced from their homes. According to the UN 
refugee commissioner, 2.3 million Iraqis have now fled the country, 2.3 million are internally displaced. That's 20% of the country. The equivalent of that in our country would mean 25, American, 25 million Americans exiled, 25 million Americans internally displaced. It's a bit like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans multiplied 100 times. The media's role in the Iraq invasion is very personal for me because, as you heard from Tom Hartman, I witnessed the crime firsthand until I was terminated by MSNBC along with Phil Donahue for political reasons three weeks before the invasion. Those of us who challenged the evidence that Iraq was somehow a threat and warned that this invasion would lead to chaos, in other words, those of us who acted with moderation, with reason, with skepticism, we acted journalistically. Many of us have been banished from the media system. Scott Ritter virtually banished from the media system. But if you echoed the official deceptions, you've seen your career flourish in mainstream media. In 2002, I debated and opposed the invasion of Iraq week after week on MSNBC, but my debates were taken away. They were taken off the air. They were replaced by non-debate segments featuring the former colonels, the retired generals, the former CIA analysts, the so-called weapons experts. These people didn't ever have to be in a debate. They didn't ever have to face a tough question. They were, project, they were presented as the independent and objective experts. One of the most ubiquitous experts in the mainstream media, especially on CNN, was the former CIA analyst and Brookings Institution fellow, Kenneth Pollack. He pushed relentlessly for an invasion of Iraq. He went on Oprah's huge TV show and said that Saddam could use weapons of mass destruction, not just in the region, but against Americans in our 48 states. Afterward, he was asked, how did you get it so wrong? And he said, quote, that was not me making the claim. That was me parroting the so-called experts. Has Pollack retired in shame as a media analyst? No, he's still a regular. He gets quoted in those front page New York Times stories by Michael Gordon on the need for staying the course in Iraq. Last summer, he co-wrote the crucially important New York Times column in support of increased troops in Iraq, the so-called troop surge. He was allowed by the New York Times and virtually every TV news network for a period of weeks to falsely pass himself off as someone who had been a critic of the Iraq war. That's a feat of propaganda that almost is bigger than what happened to us in 2003. Some of these media voices who were totally wrong about Iraq spent the last year using their media platforms to push for military confrontation with Iran. How many people have ever seen on CNN's headline news every night in prime time the Glenn Beck Show? <laughs> How many are afraid to admit that they've seen the Glenn Beck Show? For those of you who have not seen it, he spent month after month after month for a period of about a year, year and a half, placing this is on CNN, placing Iran behind every evil in the world except maybe erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Beck was hired at CNN after he had been the, one of the biggest cheerleaders for the Iraq war, after he had been on the air on Clear Channel as a talk radio screamer, wishing for the violent death of Congressman Kucinich, wishing for the violent death of Michael Moore, calling Cindy Sheehan the big prostitute. That's CNN hiring back saying, we will get fooled again and we will do our best to try to fool you again. In late 2002, when we at MSNBC's Donahue Show would discuss booking Scott Ritter as a guest about Iraq, whose analysis, of course, has been completely vindicated by events, we would hear this whispered smear. Haven't you heard that Ritter is getting that covert funding from the Saddam Hussein government? I know that smear was said at other TV networks. It was aimed at taking one of the most articulate dissenting voices off of the air. The irony for me is that I learned a few years later that one of the right-wingers I used to debate on the air at MSNBC was in fact receiving covert government funds. The covert government funder was the Bush administration, Department of Education giving the pundit Armstrong Williams nearly a quarter million dollars to promote no child left behind. 
You can see why they didn't invite me into the No Pundit Left Behind program. I've come to believe that the No Pundit Left Behind program was better funded than the No Child Left Behind. In the last months of Donahue, we were ordered by top management to carry out a quota system in our guest bookings. You've probably heard me say this before, but some of you haven't. This is the so-called liberal media ordering us. Every time we booked one guest who was anti-war, we had to book two that were pro-war. If we booked two guests on the left, we had to book three on the right. At one meeting, a producer said she was thinking of booking Michael Moore, and she was told she'd have to have, for political balance, three right-wingers. <laughs> I privately thought about uh, proposing as a guest Noam Chomsky. I decided against it because our studio couldn't accommodate the 38 <laughs> right-wingers we would have needed for balance. Tom Hartman referred to the document that leaked out after we were terminated. It basically said that Donahue represents a difficult public face for NBC in a time of war. Why? He seems to delight in presenting guests who are anti-war, anti-Bush, and skeptical of the administration's motives. And the internal memo described NBC's nightmare scenario where Donahue becomes, quote, a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. NBC got rid of Donahue, picked up the flag, and they outfoxed Fox, and that's not easy. I want to finish with the good news in the realm of media, and that's that independent media are booming. Tom Hartman was here, an important independent voice in media who's getting bigger voice week after week. And if his program is not carried in cities across the country, you have him here in Portland, make sure your friends and your relatives are getting him on the air in other cities because he needs to be heard in every major city. A key turning point. A key turning point in the growth of independent media was Iraq. As our country's invading Iraq, Phil Donahue was being terminated. Scott Ritter is basically being banished. I learned at MSNBC that the former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark was on some sort of blacklist. They're waving flags. They're not doing journalism. And this led to a crisis of confidence among the American media consumer, and that is a great thing. As a consequence, BBC at the time was reporting increased uh, audience from Americans. We now have millions of internal exiles from US corporate media. These are exiles not just from the jingoism, but from the tabloidism of a mainstream media that is much more aggressive in investigating the criminal involvements of Paris Hilton and Britney Spears than war criminals and corporate criminals. Independent blogs that started in 2002 are booming. Or later, Ariana Huffington has a huge audience. It wasn't started until a couple years ago. Independent websites like Common Dreams and Alternate are growing. Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! expanded from radio to radio, TV, and the web, and every week is adding a new station. I was at MSNBC when Trent Lott, the Majority leader in the Senate made his comments endorsing the 1948 segregationist campaign of Strom Thurmond, and there were mainstream media reporters in the room, and they didn't even think about it. It wasn't reported by them. But independent bloggers wouldn't let it go, like Atrios and Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo. And because of their intense coverage of these bloggers, Trent Lott had to resign the most powerful position in the Senate. The corporate media was asleep. Independent media did the job. Today, Talking Points has a staff of a half a dozen journalists. They played a huge role in turning the politically motivated firings of the U.S. attorneys by the Bush White House into a national story, into congressional hearings. Again, success of independent media, corporate media sleep. The Internet has been key to the growth of independent media, not just media based on the internet. Many of you are familiar with the documentaries of Robert Greenwald. He finances these documentaries online, and he finds his audience online. He has no TV network behind him, no movie studio behind him. In 2006, when he was, trouble raise, he was having trouble raising funds for the documentary he wanted to make about war profiteering, the one that became Iraq for sale, he decided to go online and ask for people to become producers of that movie by giving $50. I gave my $50. They needed 4,000, quote, producers. 
In 10 days, they raised $267,000 on the internet. The movie was quickly made, way before the mainstream media ever focused a critical eye on Blackwater. This movie was being seen during the 06 elections across the country. Early last year, way before the mainstream media awoke, the independent journalist and longtime Democracy Now! correspondent Jeremy Scahill was putting out his book, Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, and it's become a huge New York Times and other bestseller. This is an exciting time for independent media. A growing number of independents are actually making a living working in independent media. That's something I could only dream about when I was a young journalist. The rise of independent blogs and independent websites and Netroots net groups like Move On and others have put independent documentaries and books on the bestseller list. Independent media and media activism have grown. People are here because you know you can't trust the corporate media. You know uh, that FAIR, when we started it 20 years ago, we had a slogan, it's more relevant than ever now, and it's resonating more than ever. Don't take the mainstream media lying down. I want to thank you for bearing with me, and I want to turn over the floor to one of the most important experts on the Middle East. He's an individual who we know was a former Marine, former U.S. military intelligence officer, former U.N. weapons inspector. He's the author of crucial articles throughout the web on sites like Truth Dig and Common Dreams. The author of books like Iraq Confidential. He's, they're out there. We're ready to sign books for you uh, uh, before you leave tonight. Iraq Confidential is a crucial book written in a timely manner. Target Iran in his latest book, Waging Peace. I'll just leave you with the words of perhaps our greatest journalist today, Seymour Hirsch, who said, the most important thing you need to know about Scott Ritter is that he was right. Scott Ritter. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Jeff, for the fantastic presentation and the absolute uh, wonderful introduction. I'm embarrassed almost by it. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. You know, earlier today I had the, uh, the distinct uh, privilege of addressing this same forum with a different audience. Uh, it was the uh, student body of uh, Lincoln High School. And, um, <laughs> The seats were packed with uh, America's youth. Um, and I, I take high school kids seriously. I happen to be the father of twin 14-year-old daughters who are starting their ninth grade. And uh, we'll leave to the aside the moment all the challenges that uh, <laughs> being the father of twin 14-year-old daughters uh, presents. Uh, but the, the fact is, you know, when we talk about the problems that we are confronted with as a society, the problems that Jeff so eloquently speaks of uh, it, the media, the government, the, the situation we find ourselves in abroad. Problem after problem after problem. What is one thing we've all been taught when it comes to the, the question of how do we solve a problem? I mean, we're, we're, we're searching for a solution. What's the first thing we have to do when we are searching for a solution? That's exactly right. Define the problem. What is it we're trying to solve? What is it we're trying to solve? And you know, here we are. I, I have trouble. The lights are in my eyes. I, I'm looking out. I assume the vast majority of the people in the audience tonight are above the age of 20. Um, and I'll leave it at that. That's the lower limit. We won't discuss the upper limit. And my point is, you know, We've, we've sort of settled into our, our life, our frame of reference. We know what we believe in. 
we're sort of stubborn on that. I believe in this and you're not going to change me. I've been doing that my entire life. And that's fine, you know, because we're here today amongst friends. We're preaching to the choir. I have good reason to believe there's not too many neoconservatives in the audience tonight. <laughs> I'd bet a dime to your dollar <laughs> and I'd win that bet. Um, so, you know, we can sit here and I can throw out fact after fact and we can have talks about it. I reckon we'll talk about some of that, but you know what? There's not much I'm going to say that's going to change your mind. You're here because we're in agreement. We're not here to enter into a debate. I'm not going to debate you about the Iraq war. How many people actually believe that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before we invaded? No, that debate's done. It actually never happened, but it's done. <laughs> it's done. No, the, our, our problem isn't us. We're on the right side of history. We're on the right side of the facts. We're doing righteous work. The problem is there isn't enough of us. The problem is that when you take a look at this crowd, and I first of all, thank you very much for coming out tonight, but we're not the problem. The problem is the rest of the population of Portland, Oregon, that's out there tonight doing their thing, ignorant of what's transpiring here, of what we're talking about here. And one of the main issues is that most of those people out there in Portland, Oregon tonight are over the age of 20. Like us, they are entrenched in their way of thinking. They've made up their mind. Whether it is to believe George Bush or whether it is to wallow in ignorance, they're happy. No, the high school kids is where it's at because that is the generation that needs to be impacted. They're the ones that need to be imbued with a sense of responsibility, with a sense of worth, with a notion that they do matter. With the concept that if they empower themselves with knowledge and information, they never need to fear having their ignorance manipulated by others. And frankly speaking, in this nation we call the United States of America, our major downfall collectively has been our ability to wallow in ignorance. And from that ignorance of the world we live in, fear is generated that enables politicians to manipulate us, to set us down a path that leads to death and destruction. Think about it, think about it. Iraq, first of all, how many people, again, guys, I'm speaking to the choir, so when I say how many people, I'm not talking about ye who are in the audience tonight. We are true believers. I'm talking about the heathens that are out there, <laughs> walking the streets, living their lives, ignorant of what's going on. How many people actually could point out Iraq on a map? And yet we're gonna to go to war against this country. We were told that Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein, that very name alone, brought in an image of a dark-haired, swarthy, mustachioed, Stalin look-alike who'd stare you down. And Saddam Hussein was the number one threat in the world today, not only to America, but the world at large. This dictator from Tikrit, the leader of a nation of 24 million people, was somehow a big enough threat to put nearly seven billion people quivering in their shoes. How absurd is that? How absurd is that notion? No, but it's okay. 24 million people reinforced by weapons of mass destruction. Think of that very term. Weapon of mass destruction. I know what a WMD is. At least I know how it's defined by U.S. code and by international law. How it was defined by the United Nations. Chemical weapons. They're horrible things. I'm not trying to denigrate them. I'm not trying to belittle them. A chemical weapon produced in its pure state can do horrible things to you. It can make you drown in place as it gets into your lungs and bursts and fills your lungs up with liquid. It can blister your skin and cause your body to fail. It can get into your central nervous system and kill you that way. Biological weapons does the same thing except they use biology, not chemistry. 
Nuclear weapons can devastate entire cities. Ballistic missiles are capable of being tipped with chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, therefore taking this lethal payload and sending it thousands of miles away to take out cities. No, I know what a WMD is. And I can tell you right now that with the exception of the nuclear weapon, there's nothing to fear when it comes to chemical and biological weapons. And I don't mean that they can't hurt you. But what I'm saying is if you allow people to hijack science and place words, terms, give it titles, breathe life where no life is, more people will be killed by a Marine Corps rifle company this year in Iraq than died in chemical weapons attacks in the last 30 years. But do we call a Marine Corps rifle company a weapon of mass destruction? No. We use the term weapon of mass destruction for one reason and one reason only, to intimidate you, to make you fearful of that which you do not know and understand, to scare you into accepting at face value everything that follows. Jeff mentioned it. What's one of the catchphrases that emerged in the buildup to, to the Iraq war? We don't want, you guys can almost repeat this for me, <laughs> we don't want the smoking gun to come in the form of the mushroom cloud. How many times did they have to say that before the American public was just wallowing in fear? Fear based on ignorance. Most Americans had no clue what a mushroom cloud was, but they didn't want it to come. <laughs> No, we, we as a collective, the American people, are disappointing. We are very disappointing. You know, we, we, we've been blessed geographically and historically with a parcel of land that has given us access to riches and given us access to isolation at critical times in the world's development so that we were able to become this nation state that goes from sea to shining sea. And we were able to develop our wealth in a manner which makes us one of the richest nations on the face of the earth, isolated from the depravity that the rest of the world was going through and suffering from so that we emerge relatively unscathed into the century we find ourselves in. We have no excuses, no excuses for the path we have chosen, except one, and it's not an excuse, it's a condemnation. Hubris, arrogance, that's our sin as a nation, collectively. Hubris and arrogance, how dare we, the people of the United States of America, all 300 million of us, how dare we have the audacity to say that we alone get to dictate the terms of existence with 6.8 billion other people around the world today. That the world is our backyard. That the world belongs to us. That we, the people of the United States, are the only people that counts. That when we say, God bless America, what are we truly saying? God damn the rest of the world. <laughs> Think about it. God shed his grace on thee. Well, what about the others out there? Now, I'm not a very religious person, but I sort of take umbrage at those who twist the teachings of a man named Jesus who ostensibly stood for peace, loving, understanding, and suddenly we have become a Christian nation that espouses war. War as a means of doing God's work? There's something wrong with this picture, ladies and gentlemen. There's something dreadfully wrong with this picture. You know, we got misled into a war in Iraq. I'll give the American people the benefit of the doubt on this one, because we are the most technologically advanced nation on the face of the earth, populated by the singularly most ignorant people on the face of the earth when it comes about the earth we live in. So I'll give them a pass. You know, and it's tough, because we want to believe. 
We want to believe our government's going to do the right thing. We want to believe that the president, when he says something, is telling us the truth, has our best interests at heart. All right, if that's truly how you were operating, you're forgiven. The president lied. Get over it. But never again fall victim to that trap. Never again accept at face value anything this government says, whether you believe they're telling the truth or not. It's not our job as citizens to nod our heads blindly when the government says something. Our job as a citizen is to remind those whom we elect to higher office that they work for us. I don't work for them. They work for me. I pay them with my taxes. They're responsible to me. They are held accountable by me. And how do I know this? I've read the Constitution of the United States of America. In addition to taking an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America, I've actually read it and understand my role and my responsibility as a citizen. Key among which is to hold those whom I elect to represent me in higher office accountable for what they do in my name. In October of 2002, the President of the United States stood before the American people and told them that he knew, he knew there were chemical weapons and biological weapons in Iraq. He knew. I'm a simple Marine. He didn't say he thinks. He didn't say, I believe. He didn't say there, there might re be reason to believe. He said, I know that there are chemical and biological weapons in Iraq. Now, when someone says they know something, that implies certainty of knowledge which means it must be backed up with a certain body of fact. And all I asked of the president, you see, I just happened to be a humble chief inspector of the United Nations who spent seven years in Iraq from 1991 to 1988 managing the problem of hunting down weapons of mass destruction. So the president surprised me when he said he knew there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Because I, I went back and quickly checked the rosters of the inspectors, because I, I pretty much <laughs> was involved in every inspection that went in. And I said, wait a minute, did George W. Bush slip into one of these inspections? <laughs> did, he, did he get down there? Does he know something? I don't. And the answer was, of course not. He hadn't been to Iraq. He, he, he hadn't done the inspection. But he said he knew. Said, Benefit of the doubt passed you, Mr. President. I, I'll give you, OK. But if you know, that means you got to have some facts. And all I ask from you, Mr. President, is to share the facts with me so I can share your certainty so I can stand side by side with you as we go forth to counter this threat to American security. But it's transpired that there were no facts, that the president didn't know anything, that the president was lying. And the media let him get away with the lie. And the American public sat there and did nothing. We won't get fooled again, right? We learned our lesson. Right? And yet today we have the President of the United States overseas in the Gulf Arab states talking about Iran. The President says Iran is the number one threat facing the United States and the world today. This threat comes in the form of dual nasty operations. One being an Iranian nuclear weapons program. And the second being Iran's status as the largest state sponsor of terror in the world today. Let's talk about the Iranian nuclear weapon program for a second. It's a curiosity because in the summer of 2007, over and over again, you were told by the Bush administration and by senior intelligence officials and by the media that parroted all this so effectively that Iran has an ongoing nuclear weapons capability that they are hiding from United Nations weapons inspectors. And that Iran can have a nuclear bomb any day now. Well, they didn't all say that. I mean, the CIA covers themselves. One day the CIA said, well, they, Iran's capable of having a nuclear weapon in a matter of months. And then they say, the CIA, the CIA says, Iran's capable of having a nuclear weapon in a matter of 10 years. It's curious that 10-year figure. Portland, Oregon can have nuclear weapons in 10 years. 
My hometown of Del Mar, New York, can have a nuclear weapons program in 10 years. You can pick any place on the face of the earth, and in 10 years, I can have a nuclear weapons program there if you give it enough money. <laughs> if you say Iran can develop a nuclear weapon in 10 years, it means we don't know what they're doing. And that's the closest thing to the truth the CIA will ever come to saying about Iran. We don't know what they're doing. But in late 2007, the CIA published a national intelligence estimate that dramatically reversed the findings. They said, time out. We now believe that Iran stopped its nuclear weapons program in 2003 and that there is no ongoing nuclear weapons program activity in Iran today. And you know what happened? All the people who were critical of the Bush administration immediately stood up and said, hallelujah, prove my point, in spades. We win. No nuclear program, we told you. Bush was a liar, da 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 da. I sat there and I went, that, that estimate's wrong. That estimate's very wrong and you should not embrace this estimate. It's a very dangerous thing to embrace this estimate. Because if you accept the conclusion, which I concur with, that Iran does not have an active ongoing nuclear weapons program today, you have to accept the underlying premise which is in 2003, they had a nuclear weapons program. I continue to contend that Iran has never had a nuclear weapons program and the facts back me up. The Bush administration has jumped on this estimate and said that the fact that Iran had a nuclear weapons program in 2003 and has not yet declared it means that they cannot be trusted and that we don't know what truly is going on inside Iran today and that they continue to be the number one threat to international peace and security and the United States of America in the form of this undeclared nuclear weapons program. The president is overseas right now telling the Gulf Arab states that the threat to the world comes from Iran and its nuclear program and it must be dealt with. If Iran does not answer the questions that the United States has spoon fed the International Atomic Energy Agency to the satisfaction not of the international community but of Washington DC, then the United States will have no choice but to act on what the President has said, which is all options remain on the table including the military option. If you believe for a second that there is not an imminent threat of war between the United States and Iran, you are wrong, ladies and gentlemen, because this president wants war. This president has said that he will solve the Iranian problem before he leaves office, and that solution will be inclusive, inclusive of regime change in Iran, and that will not come peacefully. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the verge of war. That's why I'm excited, not because I'm happy, it's because I'm angry. We're on the verge of war, but our nation is sleepwalking. We pretend there is not a problem at all. No, there is a huge problem, ladies and gentlemen, a huge problem. The president says there's another thing we need to be worried about. Iran's status as the largest state sponsor of terror in the world today. <coughs> they back this up with talk about Iran's relationship with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and they call Hezbollah a terrorist organization. The fact that Iran continues to fund Hezbollah and support Hezbollah proves the president's point. Now, I'm not here to defend Hezbollah or speak high praise of Hezbollah, but I'm an American. When was the last time Hezbollah attacked the United States of America? Why do I really give a rat's butt about Hezbollah? Now, if I were Israeli, I'd, I'd care, I'd be concerned about Hezbollah, I'd also have to sit there and go, wait a minute, what's the cause and effect relationship again? Israel invades and occupies southern Lebanon, and Hezbollah is formed to kick Israel out of southern Lebanon. Who's the terrorist? I don't know. I asked the kids today, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask you the question here. How many people saw that movie, um, it's a classic, and I say that with all the sarcasm I can muster, Red Dawn? Oh yeah. Red Dawn, it's a great movie. I mean, it's awesome. Really, it is. You got the Russians and the Cubans invading America. 
Now, for all you closet socialists out there, it was just a movie. Okay. <laughs> They invade and they occupy America, and it's based in Colorado, you see, and you're up there, and you got this community, and they got a high school, and the, 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 the motto of the high school, the, the slogan is the Wolverines, tough little critters, ornery. And, here, and the Wolverines are out there hunting, doing whatever high school kids do up in Colorado in the mountains, and the Russians and the Cubans come in, and they occupy their town. And the kids are saying, this will not stand. We can't have oppressors in our town. And they watch in frustration as the Russians and the Cubans kick down the doors of their houses and drag their fathers and their older brothers off and put their mothers in camps and maltreat everybody. And they say, uh-uh, not on my watch. And so they take the Russians and the Cubans on, but they can't match them toe to toe because the Russians got these tanks, these helicopters and stuff. So they, they come up with innovative ways of uh, uh, opposing these brutal occupiers. They blow them up with car bombs. They shoot them with flaming arrows. That's one of my favorite. You know, when the Russian gets hit with a flaming arrow and screams and runs around. It's good stuff, great cinematography. But the bottom line is, they end up blowing up these Russians in, in these sneak attacks, and they stand up there and they sell, shout, Wolverine! Now, big question. Are the Wolverines patriots or terrorists? Are the Wolverines patriots or terrorists? Now, the perspective is all important here. From the perspective of the United States of America, these are hyper-patriots. They're taking down the brutal occupier. But now I remember watching that movie, and you got the Russians and the Cubans coming together, and they're calling these guys brutal terrorists, and they're putting together a task force to take down the terrorists, take down the cells, take down the families. Iran is the largest state sponsor of terror in the world today, we are told. Wow. I would like to believe that anybody if you take U.S. code in the definition of terrorism, and I can't quote it to you verbatim here, but the notion is using violence as a means of pursuing political objectives. That's sort of what it talks about. Violence is a means of pursuing political objectives. The United States invades and occupies Iraq in violation of international law to pursue an ideological objective of achieving regime change in a nation to impose American will on a region. Violence to achieve, who's the terrorist in Iraq? Us or them? And I'm not denigrating the American soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. They're doing a job, but it's a nasty job they've been asked to do. It's an illegitimate job. It's a job they should never have been given. It's a job we, the people of the United States, should reject. Iran is the largest state sponsor of terror in the world today? No, ladies and gentlemen, no. If you want to point a finger at the largest sponsor of state terrorism in the world today, point it right at ourselves. It's the United States of America seeking to impose our will on 6.8 billion others. And unless we correct this, unless we correct this, there will be hell to pay. Because we, we live in a world that is governed by Newton's second law of physics. You know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Believe it or not, that applies to the human condition as well. If we go out and push and impose and bully, there will be a reaction to our action. That's why I enjoy talking to these students, because these students have yet to be imbued with the hatred, with the chauvinism that the majority of the American people seem to be imbued with when it comes to talking about the rest of the world. If I go to the average bar in downtown, small town America and say Ahmadinejad in Iran, people will spit on the floor. And yet here with the high school kids, I could talk about Ahmadinejad in Iran and speak common sense and let the facts prevail. The youth are our future, ladies and gentlemen. The youth are the only hope we have for ourselves as a football team that has a track record of fumbling and throwing interceptions. We are not doing a good job. The only chance we have of winning the championship is to ha pass the ball off to the next generation. Therefore, our job is not to win the game. We can't. We failed. Our job is to buy enough time so that the next generation can do a better job than we have done. The next generation must empower itself with knowledge and information so that it will never be 
intimidated by their collective ignorance. Never allow fear to emerge from this ignorance can be manipulated by government officials. The next generation must have the courage to stand up and say, we are responsible for our own actions. We will not become the tools, the compliant tools of a government that doesn't understand the notion of accountability to citizens. That is what we must strive for. That is what we must accomplish. Now, how do we do that? I don't know. I can't give you a playbook, but I'll leave you with this thought. Jeff talked eloquently about the media. I'm not quite as eloquent. I'm a good person, though, for parceling and out blame and responsibility. I blame the media for a lot. The media, you know, you know how it is when, you, when you're not popular anymore, they, they call you bitter, and what was the other, you know, those other terms they put out there, disgruntled, disgruntled, disgruntled bitter former inspector Scott Ritter. You know. <laughs> yeah. Every time I hear that, I expect to see this wizened old <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not disgruntled and bitter, I'm just sort of angry. You know. <laughs> but I can still put a smile on my face. Now, um, you know, people talk about the media and they say it's all the media's fault. It is. It's all the government's fault. It is. I, I don't debate that point, but there's a third part to this. We the people, it's our fault. Have we forgotten what it is to think? Have we forgotten what it is to function? You know, when I hear people say, Scott, tell me, where can I get all the information needed to empower me to be the citizen you want me to be? I, say, I don't know. <laughs> I can't give you that answer. All I can tell you is that when I hear people say it's the media's fault they're not giving us what we need to know, it reminds me of New York in springtime. I love New York in springtime. We've got tough winters where I'm from. A lot of snow. So the snow melts, the leaves blossom, and all the birds come back. And those birds do what birds do, and they build nests, and then those little eggs appear in the nests, and sure, sure enough, out come the little birds. Little baby birds pop in there and they sit there, a whole bunch of them. They go, tweet, 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 and it's a beautiful little noise that they make, but it's not done for my entertainment. It's done for their mom. Oh, mama bird's up there in the tree, and you can hear her. You just watch her and tweet, tweet, tweet. She flies down, she goes out, and what's she do? She gathers worms and she puts them in her stomach. She goes back to the nest and then she pukes into the mouths of her little birds. That's what they do. That's how they give food to them. She pukes in the mouths of the little birds, and the birds are happy. It reminds me of the American people <laughs> who sit there before the television and go, tweet, 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 and then they turn on the TV and the mainstream media pukes into their throat. <laughs> and the American people are happy. They're happy. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't afford to be little birds anymore. We have to become hunter raptors. And what I mean by that is, we don't wait for someone to give us the news. I call it the London effect. I go to London often, and when I go to a London hotel, I wake up in the morning, I go down to eat the wonderful breakfast that the British serve, and there's five newspapers there. And I get to pick up all five newspapers, and if I pick up The Guardian, I know The Guardian is the mouthpiece of the labor organization. It's got a built-in bias. The Guardian doesn't pretend to be anything other than what it is, the mouthpiece of the left. I pick up The Times, of London, it's the mouthpiece of the right. It doesn't pretend to be anything other than that. I got the independent, social democrats. You go on and on and on. I get the sun, I don't know what the sun is. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, I guess, yeah. yeah. But bottom line is, they don't pretend to be, it's not like the New York Times where they pretend to be all the news that's fit to print and the American people buy into this nonsense. The British don't play that game. It's the Guardian. They will publish what's beneficial to the left. It's the Times, they will publish what's beneficial to the right, and you know that when you read it. So you read all five newspapers, and you start saying, how come the Guardian gave more weight to this, and the Times gave less weight to that? What's going on there? How come they overreported this, underreported that? You take all the facts, and you know what happens as you start to read the five newspapers? An amazing thing. You form an independent point of view. Ooh. Scary concept. I'm suddenly able to think on my own. 
I'm not held prisoner to the Guardian, the Times, the Independent, or the Telegraph. I got my own point of view. What happened? The most powerful supercomputer on the face of the Earth, the one between this earlobe and this earlobe, suddenly engaged. And that's what we need to do. We need to start empowering ourselves, not by waiting for someone to puke down our throats, but to go out and gather the information and form the point of view on our own. And if we're too old and stubborn to do that, then we need to empower our youth to do that. And that should be our project, ladies and gentlemen, empowering America's youth to think on their own, to become the kind of citizen this nation must have if it is to survive. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. You've been listening to journalist and media analyst Jeff Cohen and former United Nations weapons inspector Scott Ritter speaking in Portland, Oregon as part of the U.S. Tour of Duty public lecture series. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from this program. Jeff Cohen is founder of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. His books include The Wizards of Media Oz, co-authored with Norman Solomon, and most recently, Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media. To find out more about Jeff Cohen and his work, please visit his website at www. Dot jeffcohen.org. Scott Ritter is author of Iraq Confidential, the untold story of the intelligence conspiracy to undermine the UN and overthrow Saddam Hussein. And Target Iran, the truth about the White House's plans for regime change. And Waging Peace, the art of war for the anti-war movement. And now we return to the question and answer session of this program. The first question has to do with the presidential race. If Clinton is elected, what are the prospects for ending the war in Iraq? Okay, thank you, Kim. And progressive, Liz, progressive Democrats of America, Liz, I, sh I should admit, I'm on the National Advisory Board. It's a group that includes seven of the best Congress members, Cindy Sheehan, Medea Benjamin, trying to put together an independent grassroots movement to take over and transform that party. In terms of Hillary Clinton, it's not something you want to get me started on. Uh, if you go to the web my website, jeffcohen.org, you'll see that I've been writing about her I live in New York along with Scott. I've never voted for a Clinton. I never expect I ever will. Uh, the closer you look at the Clintons, you see politicians that are out for themselves, uh, in service to big power interests, unwilling to change a U.S. foreign policy that, as Scott Ritter has pointed out, is utterly out of control. People ask me, my, what do you do in a situation where Obama seems to be trying to imitate Hillary? Uh, you know, they're trying for vagueness, for national chauvinism, for militarism, for Israel right or wrongism, for threatening the Iranianism, if that's an ism. So the point is that I believe Obama would appoint a slightly better cabinet and slightly better people. I believe John Edwards would appoint a cabinet like we haven't seen since Franklin Roosevelt. Um, there, to, to me, to me, there is such a difference between what Edwards is saying and who Edwards is working with and the unions that are behind him and his campaign chairman, Dan, David Bonnier, who was our hero in fighting against U.S. intervention in Nicaragua when he was in Congress. There's just such a big difference between Edwards and the other two. So my, I give you my advice, and you know, my advice is if Edwards is still viable when you vote, vote for Edwards. I think he's the one who would surround himself with people that would listen to Scott Ritters and listen to outside critics and dissidents. Um, if it's between, if it just gets narrowed down to Obama and Hillary, I would just ask you to investigate and see whether Obama is sufficiently enough better than Clinton. It's hard to be worse than the Clintons. I talk about them as the duo that they've always been. Um, if, there, if, it's all, if it's just Hillary and Kucinich, proudly organized for Kucinich. I believe, if, I believe a, vote, a vote for Kucinich is a smart vote, it's an ethical vote, it's a good vote, but I'm telling you that if, if I get a chance to vote and Edwards is still in the race, while he's far from perfect, I'm going to proudly vote for John Edwards. Uh, 
I, I don't have too much to add on to that. Um, I, I did try to form a progressive party of Republicans and um, didn't work. So, <laughs> but uh, for now. But the, look, the, the Republican Party is busy competing with itself on who can be more like George W. Bush. And um, that's the good news, because as long as they do that, I think this is the Democrats' election to lose, um, which means we're probably going to have a Democratic president in, uh, as, as a result of the 2008 election. Um, the, the bad news is that, let's say, if, if the election comes down to, if you, if you look at the polls today, McCain uh, versus uh, Clinton. Um, on domestic policy, I think there's quite a bit that separates the two. And I, you know, I, I'm not here to criticize Hillary Clinton on her domestic uh, agenda. I, I don't know too much about domestic policy. On foreign policy, though, there's really not much that separates them at all. And that's, that's the problem. Our, 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 what's going to bring this nation down in the next decade is how we interact with the rest of the world, our failure to interact in a responsible fashion. And if we're looking for true change, you're not going to get it with the mainstream uh, representatives of the party. And, and I say representatives of the party because they're not the representatives of we the people. That's, that's the problem. When we take a look at our population base, 300 million people, is this truly the best we can produce? And the answer is absolutely not. And, and so we have to talk about why it is we're confronted with this, this horrific situation where we have Hillary Clinton, John McCain representing the best our country can offer as, as our nation's leader. And the answer basically comes down to, to, to one thing, it is campaign finance reform. And if there's one thing I can encourage people to focus on when it comes to domestic policy, it is campaign finance reform. We have to eliminate the power that moneyed special interests have in placing their representatives on our ballot. Thanks. The next question from the audience raised a number of concerns, but asked specifically about how a war in Iran would affect relations with China and India. What I would say about the, look, again, I'm not a domestic policy person. Uh, I, I, I've expressed my dissatisfaction with how Congress does the people's business, because it doesn't do the people's business, it does the business of special interest. Um, the, the war in Iraq and the war in Iran, the one thing you talked about, um, you know, how you said at the end, how, how it can affect India and China. I'm not worried at all about India and China or Russia or any other nation becoming involved militarily as a result. Why would they? I mean, if you think about it, we are watching the death of an empire. We're watching the demise of the new Rome. Unfortunately, the new Rome is the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, unless we can reverse this trend, what we're watching is America falling apart at the seams internationally. I don't want that as an American. I actually believe that the United States of America has a role to play in terms of uh, a leadership in the world today. Not leadership of the dictatorship kind, but leadership of the kind that comes with moral integrity. We have a constitution that's based upon principles that we should be proud of. And these are principles that could be held up to the rest of the world, not saying that we force you to be like us, but to say, this is how we do business. And uh, if you guys want to talk about it, we can talk about it. Uh, use us as a role model if you want. But we are involved in India and China. What are the two largest, this is a question I had, the high school kids got this, what are the two largest developing economies in the world today? India, China. What do they need to develop their economies? Oil. So now you get into what America's doing. You know, Dick Cheney had a secret little oil cabal thing meeting going on when they first came into power back in 2001, 2002. And one of the things they talked about wasn't to take over Iraq and Iran for the present, but to talking about imposing our will on the Middle East and Central Asia for the future. They're talking 20 to 30 years down the road. There's a lot of concern in the neoconservative ideologues about China and India. Because they, they take a look at how China and India are developing, they realize that they're going to be kicking our bucks economically if we don't do something about it. The key is to dictate the pace of economic development in China and India to the benefit of the United States, and we can only do that if we leverage our control over global energy resources. 
So if you want to know what we're doing in the Middle East and what we're doing in Central Asia, it's really quite simple. We're ensuring that the United States holds the strings on the puppet that is global energy, and it will dance when we say dance in a manner that's beneficial to us and detrimental to those we view as our counterparts. That's how India and China are involved in this whole mess. The next question from the audience asks about recommendations for the anti-war movement. I'll go quickly, then I'm going to throw this to Jeff, because I'm sure he's your got book is right up. Yeah, um, yeah the, the quick answer is buy the book. But <laughs> no, I'm, in all seriousness, go to the library and rent the book. Uh, it's cheaper. Um, the, the, the key aspect to understand when we're talking about any movement in the United States of America is, is you know, how many votes can it generate? Because we are a democracy. We're not a perfect democracy, but we're a democracy. And at the end of the day, on election day, if you don't have a Diebold voting machine uh, and using paper ballots, uh, the more people you can bring to the ballot and cast a vote in favor of you, uh, the better chance you have of winning. It's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. And when we talk about the anti-war movement, one of the big problems is its inability to generate a broad-based following amongst the American people. That's, that's the biggest problem that I see the anti-war movement face. And you've got to ask their question, why is that? And the answer, in my opinion, is quite simple. Because for the most part, the anti-war movement is drawn from the progressive left wing of the Democratic Party. I'm not saying it's exclusively drawn from the progressive left wing of the Democratic Party. I'm saying for the most part. Um, and there's a loathing to try and expand that base beyond those who agree with, uh, with, with everything that you, that you embrace. And yet the requirement to have a true anti-war movement in America is to ensure that you can get the corn farmer in Nebraska and you can get the cattle rancher in Montana and you can get the apple grower in New York to agree with the left wing of the, progress, the, the progressive uh, element of the, of the Democratic Party. That means you've got to drop the notion of Democratic Party and progressive, et cetera, and you've got to start talking about being American and embracing values set forth in the Constitution that doesn't define its audience by their political affiliation. This is about the United States of America. And the second, the anti-war movement can understand that that this is about America, not about a specific sliver of American political demographics, the better chance they have of making the next step. And it's not going to be an easy step to make, because we, we now have to overcome all the other problems of trying to get the rest of America to buy in to the, 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 the reality that we have a real problem here. And again, most of America remains ignorant about the world we live in. And from this ignorance comes fear, and this fear is manipulated by political powers that be to, to, to keep them living in a state of constant uncertainty. That's why it's important to do things like reach out to high schools, reach out and educate the youth, to reach out and tell all people, you must learn. Education is the key. Empower yourself with knowledge and information so that you will not be afraid of that which you do not know because you will now know it. You will no longer be ignorant. Therefore, you will no longer generate fear. You are no longer able to be manipulated. And when that happens, you'll find more and more people will be joining your ranks. Short story, I joined the American Legion in my hometown, not because I want to go invade another nation. Just I just got tired of being kicked around as some anti-war puke. You know, I've been to war more than most people who are members of the American Legion. So I joined it just to sit down in the bar and stare at them. And that's what I did. I'd go down to the bar on Wednesday night. They got great $2 beer. Put my two bucks down on the table, beer. And they'd all be on the other side of the bar. And I'd sit there and just drink my beer and stare at them. And I'd say, thank you very much, and I'd leave. I'd come back to next week, two bucks, beer, stare at them. And then they, they, they're not stupid, they watch TV, and eventually one come over and go, they're not finding any WMD in Iraq. And I said, no, he sit down next to me. We both sit there and get a beer, and now I'd stare at them and talk with him. And sooner or later, they all generated over. Now when I go to the American Legion, I'm welcome in open arms. Open arms, it's a lengthy process, but Americans really do want to know the truth. And that's what the anti-war movement should be pushing for, educating America about the truth, what's going on in the world today.
The next question asks for an update on the special operations that the United States already has underway in Iran. One of the things that special, and I can say this is somebody who used to work in that world, one of the things that special operators hate is having their operations discussed on national TV and in newspapers because it usually means the end of the operation. Uh, and, um, the, we, we know a couple of things are occurring uh, in, in, that, in that area. Um, we know that there's continued support by the CIA of uh, anti-Iranian regime forces out of Balochistan and Pakistan, that they carry out uh, what they call direct action operations in the, in, in the area of Iran around the, the city of Zahidan. Direct action means they blow up cars, they set off car bombs, and they assassinate figures. I, there's another term for that that we use, it's called terrorism. Um, and that's what's, that's what's happening. We know that, that that's ongoing as we speak. We know that we continue to fund the MEK, the Mujahideen al khalq operating out of bases in Iraq that are controlled by the CIA and the Department of Defense, and that these MEK operatives are working across the border to gather intelligence for the purpose of overthrowing the regime in, uh, in Tehran. Uh, we also now know that um, <laughs> You know, it's come out of the Turkish incursion in the northern Iraq. You know, the Turks are very unhappy about a uh, Kurdish liberation group called the PKK, uh, the, the patriotic uh, gr uh, group of Kurdish rebels that are seek to form a, a Kurdish homeland in Turkey. Um, the Turks are really upset because as they, um, as they are raiding PKK um, cells in Turkey, they're finding weaponry. It's American-made weaponry, and when they trace the serial numbers, it seems the serial numbers go back to weapons that are shipped to Iraq. Somehow American weapons going to Iraq find their way in the hands of PKK uh, guerrillas who then commit acts of terrorism inside Turkey, and the Turks are confused. They want to know what's going on. Well, it turns out that the United States and Israel are working with the PKK uh, because they're closely aligned with another Kurdish group called the PJAK, P-J-A-K, that happens to be the Kurds that are seeking Kurdish autonomy in Iran. And at this weaponry, these are one and the same. So the weaponry is being given to PKK to give the PJAK. It's, trust me, it's an alphabet soup. Uh, because there's also the KDP and the PUK, and there's a whole bunch of other Kurdish groups. When people speak of you know, the Kurds, understand, they're a very fractured group of people. But my bottom line is, the United States is neck deep involved in training Kurds to facilitate unrest, foment unrest inside Iran. We've also, uh, they've uncovered the same in terms of, uh, of uh, Azerbaijan. Um, you know, some enterprising um, uh, people who listen to radio broadcasts and, and do that little like, electronic nerdy thing such as what frequency is it operating on, who has bought the controlling rights to that frequency, etc. It found two radio stations operating out of Azerbaijan encouraging the Azeri population in northern Iran to rise up. And when they traced it out, one of them is owned and operated by the Mossad, and the other one is owned and operated by the CIA. Um, and so it's ongoing and active. We, we talk about diplomacy and how we seek a diplomatic solution to the problems with Iran, but the bottom line is the United States is engaged in active military action against Iran because there's no other way to define it. I can tell you right now, as somebody who used to be a, a naval aviator, if I were out flying around and somebody locked on a target acquisition radar, they didn't fire at me, they just locked on their radar, that is an act of war. If we had Cubans coming over and putting troops on the ground and blowing up refineries in Florida, that is an act of war. If we caught Soviets committing espionage, we would arrest them and prosecute them and sometimes maybe even execute them depending on the circumstances because it is a violation of our sovereignty, an act of war. We are committing acts of war on an ongoing basis against Iran as I speak. Ladies and gentlemen, the war with Iran has already begun. We just don't know it. I think it's important when people were asking us, what can we do? How many people here in this room are Republicans? One. Oh, two. So I can, they can meet afterwards. They can have the Republican caucus over here. So I'm assuming that most people are either uh, a few people are Greens, but most people here are with the majority party in Congress. That majority party includes people like DeFazio, who's a solid progressive, 
includes people that are less progressive, like Senator Wyden, but all of them are capable of having hearings. They're on important committees. We should be having committee hearings. The reason I work with Progressive Democrats of America is it, it, it includes the Congress members like Barbara Lee and Lynn Woolsey and Maxine Waters and Jim McGovern, the people that really want to transform America in a progressive direction. They, do, they don't just want to take the offices and then be Republican lights. Well, we've got to use our Congress members in uh, the majority party that I assume most of us are affiliated with and, and ask them, why haven't they begun hearings on the US active war in Iran? We're trying to overthrow a government. We're trying to do regime change. We're using terrorism to do it. Why haven't there been Senate hearings? Why haven't there been Senate hearings uh, beginning uh, this week? And this is a demand that you heard me make earlier. Senate and congressional hearings on that videotape. How did it happen? Who put it together? Who added the audio? Because I think, as, as Scott has said on a radio show we did today, it wasn't low-level people in the Pentagon that did it. That was done by people who are working very close with the neoconservatives in the White House. The next member of the audience asked the speakers to comment on the 9-11 Commission report and also asked for comment on the occupation in Afghanistan. Um, I'll, I'll just keep this short and simple. On, uh, something bad happened on 9-11. Okay, and there was a committee formed, Congressional Committee, uh, at 9-11 Commission, and um, they published a report, and that report is uh, woefully inadequate, and it leaves unanswered many questions, and I think it's imperative that, um, as Americans, we know the truth of what happened that day, what led up to that, et cetera, and so I'm all in favor of, you know, reopening the 9-11 Commission and getting to the bottom of, of everything that happened. Um, I will say this, though, in my opinion, the biggest crime took place on 9-12. And that's when the Bush administration used the events of 9-11 to propel us into a war in Iraq that had nothing to do whatsoever with, uh, with what happened on 9-11. And that war is now expanding into Iran, which likewise had nothing to do with the events of 9-11 until, until we, the people, understand that we are victims of, of, of our own ignorance, that we are allowing this government to lead us down the path of death and destruction. We've, we've got serious problems, and that's where I'll leave it on 9-11. The next question asks the speakers to comment on the limited capacity of the U.S. military to take on an additional war in Iran. We have a very large military. Uh, be rest assured that your U.S. taxpayers' dollars are being used, um, I won't say efficiently, but they are being used <laughs> to, uh, to build one of the, you know, the largest militaries in the world. If you take a look at defense spending levels, you know, we sit here and criticize the Russians for having the audacity to spend uh, you know, $100 billion. The Chinese up their defense spending, you know, to, you know they, they added another $40 billion to their defense. You know, we spend close to half a trillion dollars a year on defense. Um, now, we got a big military. It is stress. There's no doubt about that. Right now, when you talk about combat forces, uh, ground combat forces, it's pretty much we've divided them into thirds. We have one-third of our ground combat capability deployed overseas at any given time fighting the so-called global war on terror, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other deployments. We have another third that are coming back from this deployment. And then we have another third that are preparing to go in to this deployment. Um, if we go into Iran, it, it, it's very simple what they'll do. They'll freeze the troops that are in there right now, and they'll push forward the third that are preparing to go. So we have more than enough troops. This is what I keep trying to tell people. You think we can't do it? We can do it. We can start this thing. It's not a problem starting it. The problem is finishing it. And Iran will not be a cakewalk. Iran is not Iraq. It's not just a matter of N's and Q's. It's not just a matter of Arabic and Farsi. The Iranians, it's a much larger nation, they haven't been devastated by economic sanctions like the Iraqis have been. Their military is ready to fight. Think to the summer of 2006. The vaunted Israeli Defense Force is getting ready to throw its entire weight against the dastardly Hezbollah terrorists. And here comes the IDF and they're going to kick Hezbollah butt. Except they didn't. Hezbollah kicked their butt. Hezbollah fought them to a standstill. Hezbollah were the students. The teachers are the Iranians. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if we go to war against Iran, we're going to fight the teachers. And we better understand that before we start this fight. Because it's not going to be easy, and it will be drawn out, and it will not end well. We have more than enough troops to start a war with Iran. The problem is how do we finish the war? And if we don't have enough conventional power to finish this fight, this is where it gets really frightening. Because we now have a leadership in place that not only believes in the concept of usable nuclear weapons, but has actually created and deployed usable nuclear weapons. We have changed our nuclear weapons uh, implementation policy now so that we can use nuclear weapons preemptively in a non-nuclear environment which means that if we get bogged down in a conventional war with Iran and things aren't going well for us, out come the nukes. That changes everything. I want to add a postscript. When Scott talks about $500 billion yearly in military expenditures, there are historians that have looked at other empires throughout history, Rome, uh, British Empire. There's never been a time where a country spent more on its military than all other countries in the world at that time spend on their military. And if you look at the Democratic Party leadership, they don't even talk about it. Progressive Democrats talk about it. DeFazio historically has been the leader on that. But if you're Democrats and you vote for Democrats, you should be asking them, what are they doing with this outrageous uh, military budget that can only be used to defend empire? It's obviously not about defending the American people. The next question asks how likely it is that Mohamed el Baradei, the UN weapons inspector, would be successful in convincing Europeans that they are safe from a nuclear threat from Iran. And this questioner also asks, what in the world was Colin Powell thinking? What in the world, what in the world was Colin Powell thinking? Colin Powell thinking, thinking? okay. Um, we speak of the United Nations and we speak of weapons inspection, whether it be the work carried out by United Nations inspectors that I was involved in or the work that's ongoing today in Iran by Mohammed El Barda. You've got to divide it into two halves. The first half is the technical half. The second half is the political half. On the technical side, I think the track record of both what I and other inspectors did in Iraq and what Mohammed El Barda's inspectors are doing in Iran is unequivocal. Um, they, it's the most technologically advanced, intrusive arms control regime the world has ever seen. There is not a technical question that hasn't been asked and been answered, uh, and answered sufficiently or more than sufficiently. We knew as weapons inspectors in Iraq that we could account for 95 to 98 percent of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction programs. We knew that we were monitoring the totality of their industrial infrastructure with the most intrusive uh, arms con uh, you know, monitoring regime in the world. We knew that they'd neither reconstituted nor um, you know, reacquired weapons of mass destruction capability. Technolo uh, from a technical perspective, we did a heck of a job. I know I don't want to say that because Brownie did a heck of a job too. But um, <laughs> we, we did a pretty good job. And Mohammed al Baradai is doing the same thing in Iran. Since, uh, since 2002, they have sent inspection after inspection after inspection into the totality of Iran's nuclear infrastructure. They have gone in there with sensitive equipment, and they have poured over you know, every aspect of Iran's nuclear program. They've come back with a conclusion. There is no evidence to sustain the notion that Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapons program. That is a solid technical finding. That is not a political finding. That is a technical finding. The problem is now we run into the world of politics. And when we talk about the politics of the United Nations and the United Nations community, we're talking about the politics of one nation. That is the United States of America. We dominate the United Nations. And therefore, even though the technical report comes into the UN community, the United States has a unilateral political objective, one in the case of Iraq, which said we're going to get rid of Saddam Hussein and use WMD as the excuse. Therefore, we don't care about this technical finding. Or in Iran, where we're going to get rid of the theocracy, use nuclear weapons as the excuse. Therefore, we don't care about the technical finding of Mohammed el Barde. The weapons inspectors have become moot. They don't matter. What matters is the process of inspections. And what I mean by that, again, I'll tell you. Iraq was told by the United States in November 2002 they had to submit a declaration that listed the totality of its holdings of WMD. And Colin Powell, you said, what was Colin Powell thinking? Well, Colin Powell said, if Iraq does not declare its ongoing biological weapons program, 
and tell us every place these biological weapons are stored today, then this whole declaration is false. Well, Iraq submitted a declaration a couple weeks later. Of course, they didn't have a biological weapons program, therefore there's no biological weapons to declare. So the report doesn't have this. The United States took the report and said, well, because Iraq did not declare what we said they must, this is a false report, and we will now go forward into war. Today, the president has said that Iran must answer certain questions about its nuclear weapons program. Iran says, we don't have a nuclear weapons program. Therefore, when they don't answer these questions to the satisfaction of the president of the United States, we'll be heading down the path towards war. What was Colin Powell thinking? That's a personal question that can only be answered by Colin Powell. I will tell you this, at one point in time, I would have voted for Colin Powell as president of the United States of America. I had the highest respect. I've met Colin Powell. And uh, he's a man who impressed me with his, uh, with his integrity, with his intelligence, et cetera. But the form that I met him in was in Aspen, Colorado, at a little think tank run by um, a, a guy named uh, Teddy Forsman. You might have heard of an investment management company called Forsman Little. They're a leverage buyout company. The guy's worth billions. Um, in September of 1998, right after I resigned from the, uh, from the UN, I got a phone call. Uh, Teddy Forsman himself. I had no clue who he was because I don't invest money. I don't have money to invest. And <laughs> he goes, hey, we want to invite you out to this little thing we're doing in, uh, in Aspen. I said, okay, I'll come on out. He said, go down to the airport. They had a, a Gulfstream 5, <laughs> nice jet, fly me out to Aspen, Colorado, in a limo, take me to the Jerome Hotel. I mean, this was cool stuff. And the next morning, they got the first, uh, the first panel. They got like four panels going. The first panel is a foreign policy panel. Sam Nunn, Henry Kissinger, Colin Powell, the biggest names in foreign policy are there on this panel. I said, my God, this is heavy hitters. Then they had one of these medical panels. You had the guy who invented the heart, the, heart, the Jarvik heart. You had the guy who cloned Dolly. You had all these other heavy hitters there. And I'm going, this is amazing. And when I found, I said, what? how did they get all these people here? Well, the answer is they're all sitting on boards run by Forceman Little. And they all have board memberships. Colin Powell sits on a number of boards run by Forceman Little. His retirement as a four-star general is not very much. The money he makes with board membership runs into hundreds of thousands. So the money he makes in board membership events, sponsorships, run into the millions. What was Colin Powell thinking? About his economic future. Colin Powell understood that if he rocks the boat, he is biting the hand that feeds him. Colin Powell was playing the game because he bought into the game. And that's exactly, from my point of view, what happened to Colin Powell and why he told a lie when he knew it was a lie, even though it violated everything he claimed he stood for. Because at the end of the day, when Colin Powell weighed his integrity and his honor against the dollar, the dollar won out. And it was a sad day for Colin Powell and a sad day for the United States of America. I want to say something quickly about uh, the media's role in the Colin Powell speech. Within hours, I was getting stuff on the internet from British scholars, people who are real weapons experts, poking holes in the speech saying, this is not true, this is a false translation. But if you looked in the US media, here was a speech that was provable at the time, the day it was delivered, to be basically full of exaggerations and distortions. And what happened in the media? No one in the country who got their news from TV networks heard any of these voices. Why? FAIR did a study on these two crucial weeks, one week before and one week after Powell's speech, to see who was allowed to speak about Iraq on the biggest TV networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and so-called public TV, PBS, their biggest news shows. 390 people were allowed to speak. Only three of them were war critics. That's a debate that's less than 1% were dissenting voices. I always look for silver linings when I'm analyzing the media. I like to think that when you look at the debate that happened there, it was a little better than the debate on Soviet TV before they invaded Afghanistan. It's less than 1% dissenting voices at a time that every single poll, this is uh, February 03. Every single poll showed half of the country was against this rush to war. But that half of the country was not allowed to be heard on national TV. And that's why we need the independent media and we need all of us who are, how many people give money to KBU, for example? Okay, I'm in a friendly place. 
The next questioner asks the speakers to comment on opportunities for organizing on college campuses. Where, where in New York are you? Sarah College. Okay. God bless you. <laughs> um, I speak at a lot of colleges. I've been doing nothing but speaking to colleges for since 1998. Um, I mean, I, I, I've traveled from the west coast to the east coast, from the north to the south, and every place in between, and I continue to do so. Um, the, the problem with the college market. Thank you. Oh, no, it's, it's to thank, thank the colleges. I mean, it's great. But the problem with the college market is um, it's a business. Okay, you want to speak at colleges, you just don't go and say, hey, I'm, I'm see, right now, when, when I was told I was going to come out west and talk, uh, I was asked by Jeff Norman, he said, are you willing to talk at high schools? I said, yeah, every single one you can line up. And high schools are like, hey, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do that. It's not a problem. You want to speak at a college, you've got to have a speaker's bureau. So you go, you, you join a speaker's bureau, I did that, I joined a speaker's bureau, and they go out there and they pitch the colleges. The last two years are some of the most critical years in, in, in modern American history when we talk about war and peace issues. All right, especially let's take this year. We're talking about Iran. Talk about the potential of war with Iran. And I'm not trying to elevate myself, but if I were to list the top 10 Iranian experts or Middle East experts in the country, I'll put myself up there. I'm not, I'm not shy to say I know a little bit about that region. Um, the college market doesn't want to hear it. I mean, our, our, you know, the, the, the people who go and pitch the college market say, that's too heavy, man. That's too depressing. The kids don't want to hear that right now. Now, I know the students want to hear it, but the people who control the money on the campuses who can bring in the speakers are saying, we need something a little bit lighter. At least this is what I'm being told by my speakers bureau. I want to go to colleges and I want to speak at colleges because it is an important market. Why is it one of the most critical markets? Because they vote. They're of voting age. They can go out there and it's not like high school students who can get all riled up, but then on election day can't do anything about it. College students can actually go out there and vote and they need to be addressed. And I've been trying to address them, but we've got a problem because it's just like when you talk about special interests here in the United States. Colleges are run. If you take a look at how your college, I don't know if Sarah Lawrence, Sarah Lawrence has run this way, but if you go take a look at most colleges and where the money is to bring in speakers, it's controlled by a board, and that board is very selective on how they and who they bring in. And it, it just seems to me, at least this is what I've been told by the Speakers Bureau, the colleges are more interested in hearing comedians and more interested in hearing lightweight stuff. They don't want to have somebody come in and talk and depress and heavy subjects about war in Iran. I do sneak in the colleges in the indirect route uh, by going to college towns and speaking to college towns and getting access that way but it's very tough right now to break into the college market with this kind of talk it's a very tough thing we're trying to do it we're making an effort to do it but um, you know the bottom line is the colleges have to make it easier to bring it in now if Sarah if you can go back to Sarah Lawrence go 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 back to Sarah Lawrence yeah. And tell the student activity committee, let's kick up some money, contact uh, the speaker, you know, type in the name of the person you want, find the speakers bureau that represents them and contact that speakers bureau and you'll have them that quick. But unless you do that, if you're waiting for the college to do it for you, you're going to get Dave Matthews banned because it's a hell of a lot less depressing than Scott Ritter. <laughs> um, I think what's important is going beyond, let's say Scott Ritter is at a campus. Or, or Ray McGovern or Amy Goodman. We've got to go beyond just making speeches and hearing speeches. And the thing I've been trying to stress from the beginning is organization. And unless we form organizations, independent political and media organizations, we can't defeat them. And that's why it's so important that you have institutions here like KBU, you have institutions here, or people here connected to the Portland Alliance. You have, uh, you know, so I think the, the key is, how, what do we do with our, or what do we do with our knowledge? And how do we turn it into action? I just think there's, the key is or political and media organization. We need to build independent media. No generation has done it better than your generation. On the internet, uh, and, and by the way, no generation in, in, in today's voting and all the polls is more progressive than your generation. And I'm one who, you know, we were, the first question came from uh, Liz of Progressive Democrats of America. 
I, I think the best thing about the Obama movement is not the candidate, it's the people in it. And I've been to a lot of the Obama events. It's young people, it's multiracial young people. There's lots of great things happening in the country that are leading to new organization and new media institutions and independent media institutions. Uh, so I, I think that the, the key is not that we just all read and come to lectures, it's that we form ongoing organizations in our communities that work week by week by week. And, and ultimately, the reason I, you know, I had a third party background for years, the reason I joined Progressive Democrats of America is I believe, like the right wing took over the Republican Party over 20 years and converted it into something that, that really stood for principles, in my view, totally wrong ones. But they took over one of the major parties. I believe if progressive people go into the Democratic Party, and you elect people that you, they say they're gonna vote against war and they vote for war, you run against them. And you keep running in Democratic primaries, progressive candidates, until you take over that party. And once there's a major political party that stands for something, like a Democratic Party standing for progressive principles, where a DeFazio is not out on the fringe, but he's in the majority of the party, then I think our country will be on the, uh, on the verge of momentous change. The next question asks specifically what can be done to prevent a U.S. war in Iran. First of all, thank you. I, I, again, it was, a, it, was a, it was a thrill to be at Lincoln. You know, I, I've traveled a lot of high schools, and I actually um, I asked a question, how many students have read the Constitution of the United States of America, and, and a huge number of students actually raised their hand, more than I've ever seen. And then when I hit them with the challenge, how many of you want to take a test where 80% is the passing grade, uh, spot test right now, most of them kept their hands up. It was, it was impressive. I mean, so the fact that you're asking me a question that's constitutionally based is, uh, is mind-boggling. Um, when you speak, what, what you're talking about with the, with, with the powers of the presidency, you're, you're basically talking about the concept of the unitary executive. And this is something that's been, uh, been, been, been happening for some time now. It's been a constant struggle since the birth of our nation. If you go read the uh, Federalist Papers uh, into what was the, the thought behind the Constitution. It's not just the words of the Constitution, but you have to breathe life into the Constitution. It's clear from the very beginning that we intended a separation, a stark separation of powers in our government between the executive and the legislative branch. The legislative branch was given sole authority to declare war war powers authority, but this has eroded over time. And now what we have is a situation where people say that the president uh, is the commander in chief, and therefore the president is solely empowered to make decisions about going to war. And we now have a president today, President Bush, who says that he has almost dictatorial powers when it comes to war, that the Congress and the Constitution don't matter. All that matters is he, the President of the United States. This has led to some absurdities, not only from the presidency, but from the vice presidency. How many people have been following the adventures of Dick Cheney, like Alice in Wonderland, where he's created a never-never land of constitutional ambiguity between the executive and the legislative, saying that as the President of the Senate, I am responsible to the legislative branch, but as the vice president, I'm part of the executive branch, therefore I'm responsible to neither, and I can do anything I want, including classify information and not be held accountable to the normal chains of authority. We laugh about this, ladies and gentlemen, but it is a violation of very principles we stand for as a nation. Now you say, what can be done? Only one thing can be done. Congress must stand up and defend its constitutional imperatives. But Congress will not do this. Congress will not do this so long as congressmen and women, our representatives, feel that the American people aren't demanding it. One thing I was trained, pounded in my head as a Marine Corps officer, because I was a righteous Marine Corps officer, and I would do what I would thought was right. And I'd stand before my general, my colonel, oftentimes explaining myself, because I had a lot of explaining to do sometimes. <laughs> and on one particular occasion, the general looked at me and he said, Ritter, shut up. He goes, I know you're right, son. Well, let me give you a little secret. When you're explaining, you're losing. And you're explaining, so you lost. Get out of my office. No congressman wants to stand up in front of their constituency and start explaining things to them. They want to keep it simple. So it's imperative that the constituents empower themselves with a knowledge base about the Constitution, understand the separations of power, and understand what it means when you hand unilateral unitary executive power to the president that extends beyond 
legis legislative and constitutional reach, because that's where we're at today. It is a huge problem. Sir, you are going to war. Your generation will go to war. One of the saddest things is that I traveled to high school after high school after high school in 2001, 2002, telling high school sophomores, juniors, and seniors that you better wake up because this is your war. I went back to the same high schools three years later, and every single high school I went to had a student who attended that briefing dead in Iraq. Dead. Many of them had them wounded. This is not something that this generation needs to experience. Let's stop this war, but we stop this war by defending the principles and values put forth by the Constitution. Sir, I salute you for your knowledge and information for asking that question. Now join ranks with the people in this audience to get the Americans to wake up to the reality of what it means to be a citizen in this great nation. No one person is above the law. No president is above the law. Unitary executive power must be eliminated. Ask Hillary Rodham Clinton what she feels about when it comes to the issue of unitary executive power. She's on the same page as George W. Bush, sadly. The final question for the speakers asks for their recommendations for the best sources of information on these issues. Okay, best sources of information uh, to figure out what's really going on in Iran and the Middle East. I, I read, the, every day I read the website that I think is head and shoulders above all the, all the others, just because it's so simple to use, is commondreams.org. Commondreams.org gives you the Guardian, which covers the Mideast, so different than our media. The British Independent, especially Patrick Coburn, who covers the Mideast, so different than our media. Scott Ritter's columns are always on Common Dreams. My columns, Amy Goodman's columns, Amy Goodman's transcripts. You can all find it on commondreams.org. And it's, I think, in my view, the best of the mainstream media and the best of the independent media and the best of the European media. You've been listening to journalist and media analyst Jeff Cohen and former United Nations weapons inspector Scott Ritter speaking in Portland, Oregon as part of the U.S. Tour of Duty public lecture series. To find out more about the U.S. Tour of Duty campaign, please visit their website at www.ustourofduty.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find links to resources for more information on this and other topics, and you'll find programs with speakers such as Naomi Klein, Noam Chomsky, Raed Jarar, Susan Faludi, and many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.